Hello and welcome to part two of our parliamentary review of the year, in which we look at the highs and lows in the Commons and Lords in 1999, the main flashpoints, the big stories and of course the personalities. Coming up in the next half hour, Tony Blair persuades Ken Clark and Michael Heseltine to come on board as arguments continue to rage over the single European currency. But elections to the European Parliament cause governmental gloom as voters give proportional representation the thumbs down. Devolution comes to Wales, but the Welsh Assembly sets MPs wondering at Westminster what's left for them to talk about. But we begin with Europe. MPs and peers spent all of 1999 arguing about it. Easy money betting they'll spend all of 2000 arguing about it too. Has there ever been a day in recent British politics when someone somewhere wasn't arguing about whether or not to join the single European currency? The year began with a national changeover plan designed to prepare business for the possibility of dealing in euros. What we announced today, therefore, is not a change of policy, it is a change of gear. If we wish to have the option of joining, we must prepare. The sheer nature, scale and complexity of the arrangements require considerable time for such preparation. It is, for example, far more detailed in its consequences than decimalisation. If we do not start to face this reality now, we will simply not have the practical means necessary to make a choice. He has built his recent career on being all things to all people, on reassuringly facing in one direction while heading off in another. It is the trick he has perfected, and he has now surpassed himself. While he trumpets his love for the pound, it is his love for the euro which is the love that dare not speak its name. Is not this statement, Madam Speaker, a statement at two levels? The level you see and the level you are supposed not to see. The level you see is a perfectly sensible statement about measures of preparation for the euro. We welcome those. They're sensible, they're realistic, they're practical, and I'm glad they will be debated in this House and voted upon. The level we don't see is the continuation of the government's policy of leadership by stealth. We move forward a millimetre at a time. By the end of the summer, the Conservative position on the single currency had hardened further, with William Hague threatening to veto any new European treaty that did not contain a flexibility clause. It must make sense not to adopt the rules and regulations of other countries, but to get rid of more of our own. And the stakes were raised even higher when Tony Blair was joined by two pro-European Tory grandees, Michael Heseltine and Kenneth Clark, at the launch of the Britain and Euro campaign. Why is the Prime Minister so content to be carried along with the tide to a single European state? What the great majority of the British public want from Europe is very straightforward. They want cooperation with other European nations on issues like fighting drugs and many of the other issues rightly discussed at Tampere. But what they do not want is for ever more rights and powers of this country taken away, slice by slice, with their own Prime Minister wielding the knife. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker. It's no wonder Norman Tebbett said he'd never have felt happier in the Conservative Party than today. <laughs> the Thatcher rights have won, haven't they? They've taken it over. Not the back seat driver anymore. She's kicked him out of the front seat and she's now... She's going to be driving that flat back lorry, isn't she, when it goes around the country? And the, 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 only, the only chance he'll get to have a spin is when his L plates are on. Ouch. But all those arguments remain to some extent theoretical. European relations also suffered a cold dose of reality. Several, in fact, involving food, voting and fraud. The European Commission was plunged into chaos when all 20 commissioners, including the President, resigned following a damning report into allegations of fraud and mismanagement. The main charge against them, complacency and cronyism. It was absolutely right that the Commission resigned en masse. The President of the Commission should leave as soon as is reasonably and practically possible and a new President should take his place. The Commission should stay only in a caretaker role until a new Commission is appointed. There is no criticism of the two British Commissioners. Indeed, they played a key role in bringing this issue to a head and I believe that they should carry on. As far as the good side of this is concerned, it seems to me it is that for the first time the European Parliament has been prepared to act.
and to act decisively. And things will never be the same again. In future, they will always now take an attitude and carry it through. But the European Parliament was soon at the centre of fresh controversy. The elections in June for British MEPs were held under the closed list system of proportional representation. It wasn't popular and the turnout in Britain was the lowest of any EU member state and the Conservatives won their first nationwide election since 1992. May I offer my sympathy to the Leader of the House for the yeah. miserable week she's had recently? Yeah. She was forced to lead an election campaign under a system which she doesn't believe in. Sundry spin doctors put about stories that she'd disappeared in her caravan during that graceful. campaign. And she's since been blamed for the disaster which has engulfed the Labour Party when the results were announced. I suppose that I'm grateful to the, to the Honourable Gentleman uh, for his sympathy, although I must say to him that the notion that we took a week's holiday in our caravan, and entirely, I'm, of course, uh, misplaced, uh, was, was not as far as I'm aware the invention of any spin doctor. In fact, if he wants my frank opinion, I suspect it started as a newsroom joke and spread because it was too good a story to resist. Can we try to the Sherlock stage, please? Certainly, sir. Particularly but the real political beef was, well, over beef. The European Union's ban on British beef exports was lifted in August, but the French refused to comply. Thank you. Don't we now have an agriculture minister boycotting French food and the prime minister not supporting him? We have a government saying it's doing all it can, but no one's even spoken to the French minister on the telephone. We have the prime minister saying that meat fed on human sewage is safe, but that British T-bone steaks are lethal. We have British lorries being broken into and barricades on fire and no effective action being taken. Isn't it the case that in this country, when you look at these ministers, it's not just the dead cows that have had their spines taken out? Yeah. Uh, speaker. Well, come on. So that's, that's his policy. He would ban... Let's just get it right. Let's just get it right. They would ban... All French beef, yes? All French, all French poultry, all French pork, all French lamb. Madam Speaker, to start that type of trade war is a foolish, irresponsible act. I have with me the man almost of 1999 and certainly an expert on European affairs, Paddy Ashdown. Um, thanks for coming along. Um, the picture, the films we've seen, um, paints a pretty chaotic picture of European relations in 1999. Yes, the birth of great institutions always is painful and always is a bit chaotic and Europe is in the process finally of getting its act together. I mean, it's done what everybody said, including the Tories and Mrs. Thatcher, you remember, most of all, it could never do five or ten years ago. It's got itself together in a single currency, probably the second most powerful currency in the world and when it gets its act together and begins to strengthen as next year it will it may even become the most powerful currency in the world it failed to get its act together effectively on defense and now we have the Tories saying it shouldn't I mean Mrs Thatcher has ended the year with a speech um, basically saying you know a European defense force is going to threaten an essential relationship with NATO and we mustn't go down that road yes I heard that um, you know I'm a great admirer of Mrs Thatcher in many ways but I think the old birds finally gone completely dotty I mean, the fact is that the Americans have been saying for 20 years, quite justifiably, for God's sake, get your act together. Stop relying on us to come into Europe to bail you out in your own backyard, which is what happened in Bosnia and what happened in Kosovo. And so they've been saying to us, and quite rightly so, that there has to be a European pillar to NATO. That's not a new idea. It's been around for as long as Kennedy and Kissinger. In fact, they were the first two to propose it. I mean, I would argue that one of the key foreign policy aims of the next years, yeah, along with getting in getting democracy and the free market system established in Russia is maintaining the Atlantic relationship and that depends precisely on Europe carrying more of the burden of its own defense within NATO. You seem very happy, very bouncy today. How's life treating you now that you're not party leader? I'm having fun. I think my party's doing well. I think my new, the new leader, my new leader, Charles Kennedy, is a very gifted man who's mm. being very able. He's taking the party forward. I'm glad we're not hung up on the Ashdown legacy. I don't want to see the party treated as a legacy of the Ashdown years. This is an instrument to do business with, and I want my successor, Charles Kennedy, not to sit there and preserve a legacy in his armchair, but to use that to take risks with in politics, and that's what I think he's going to do. So, yeah, I'm a happy and contented man. OK, Penny Ashdown, good to see you, and thanks very much indeed. And while MPs spent much of their time arguing over Europe, 
They were also having to get to grips with changes brought on by devolution, the opening of the Welsh Assembly and the Scottish Parliament. I am pleased, therefore, now to declare the Scottish Parliament open. The opening of the Scottish Parliament in Edinburgh well and truly changed the political landscape north of the border. For the first time in two decades, Labour was going to have to share power with the Liberal Democrats. And there was political fallout too at Westminster. Aren't we really in danger of creating a rather costly constitutional nonsense, whereby we're a a group of Scottish ministers who be little more than Muppets sitting in the front bench and with no power to influence decision-making in Scotland? I don't know who the reference to Muppets was. Uh, it's not a bad team, you know, three PhDs and a millionaire. It's certainly... Uh, <laughs> I think the... Uh, I think the, the people in Scotland uh, are quite capable of deciding who and who are not Muppets, as they did in Kirkart in 1979. Now that we probably have um, devolution, would the Minister now actually give proper answers to the so-called West Lothian question, which I can assure him is greatly exercising my constituents in Bromsgrove oh, and in yeah, many other yeah, yeah, in this seat. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure, Madam Speaker, they speak of little else in the pubs of Bromsgrove, etc. <laughs> The West Lothian question. I, I must remember not to go for a good night out in a Bromsgrove pub. I'm sorry. Yeah. That, that, but this As for the Welsh Assembly, things got off to a rocky start with a clash between the new Welsh Secretary and his predecessor. I don't propose to spend any more time on political point scoring because that's what it is. It, it is what not. I, Phil I, asked it as a question. Please. This committee should have the answer. Colleagues will it's important to the committee I, and the public please, that the answer is given. Don't, don't try to browbeat me. I, mean, I wouldn't dream of it, Ron. I'm glad of that. And for devolution in Wales, read confusion at Westminster. Uh, well, this is a matter for the National Assembly for Wales, but I'm delighted to see that Christine Gwither, as the Assembly Secretary with the responsibility for agriculture and the rural economy, has taken up her duties order, with strength, order, integrity order. and determination. If the Minister announces that it is a matter for the Assembly of Wales, I cannot allow this House to trespass on the matters which are the responsibility of the Secretary of, of Wales. In that case, if the Minister tells me it is a matter for the Assembly of Wales, it cannot therefore be a matter for this House, correct? It, it would seem uh, today that the Secretary of State for Wales is hardly responsible for anything to do with Wales, and that Welsh questions will increasingly become a laughing stock if this is allowed to continue. Well, joining me now to discuss all this are the Labour MP Gwyneth Dunwoody, the former Conservative Cabinet Minister John McGregor, and the Liberal Democrats Wise Al Mingus Campbell. Let's try and talk about devolution first. We've seen John McGregor, the new Scottish Parliament, we've seen the new Welsh Assembly. Has it all been an unmitigated success? Well, I'm not in Scotland or Wales, but as far as I can see, judging particularly from the Scottish media, the Parliament has been hugely criticised and has got off to a pretty messy start. The most important thing, I think, though, from the Westminster point of view, uh, and for all the English MPs is that there is still no resolution of that age-old question of Scottish MPs voting on English matters in Westminster and English MPs not being able to vote on these issues in Scotland. And that's going to run again and again and again. I think we saw on the beef on the bone ban, we saw the Scottish tail wagging the English dog and that caused a great deal of resentment. And these sort of issues I think are unresolved and the only way to deal with it actually is not to let Scottish MPs vote on English matters. Mm. I mean, Campbell, your party is in government in Scotland. Is it, can we really have no fox hunting in Scotland, fox hunting in England, no tuition fees in Scotland, tuition fees in England? Is that a sensible yeah. way to carry on? Yeah, because that's home rule. If you decide you're going to devolve power to Edinburgh, then you've got to accept that there will be issues upon which Edinburgh will take a quite different uh, point of view from that of London. Uh, I think it's true to say, as John McGregor has pointed out, that the opening four months of the Scottish Parliament have not been uh, quite as exciting as people had expected. But you must judge the Parliament over four years. There's a very sharp learning curve. This is proportional representation. It's a government by coalition. Uh, people are finding their way. But I'm perfectly certain that both in Wales and in Scotland, by the time the four years of the Assembly in Wales and the Parliament of Scotland have been completed, people will recognise that they've got a much more efficient form of government than present than existed before Westminster was persuaded to give up power. Mm. Good afternoon, one of your colleagues are in government with Ming Campbell in uh, the Scottish Parliament. But if anyone's been really damaged by devolution, it's been your party, um, with ministers not singing off the same song sheets anywhere in the country. Well, I don't, I mean, I think there are a number of issues, and the reality is that the Scots needed self-rule, and it was quite obvious they were going to take it, and it's 
very important for the United Kingdom that you actually keep everybody on board. I believe in the United Kingdom. Uh, and the fact that Scots are not all united, though, is it? Uh, of course it is. And uh, the fact that Scots are awkward is not exactly news to me, having been in the Labour Party all my adult life. So uh, I expect them all to have cheerful rows. And I think that uh, the point that is being made, that if, if there's any point in it at all, then they must have the right to take different decisions. Now, that will occasionally be embarrassing, but then democracy is frequently embarrassing. It's one of its hazards. Do we know so there are two separate legal systems in this country, and, the, and there were, even in the days when there was no Scottish Parliament, Scots law and English and Welsh law. And, and the education system was different, exactly. all sorts of things are different. I mean, the Scots are just different, you know, dear. Do we inevitably wind up with Westminster being an English Parliament? No, I don't think so. Why should it be? After all, you've got to imagine that there are different layers of Parliament. You don't say if you have a parish council, you shouldn't have a county council or a council. And, and I think that what you've got to understand is that there will be different emphases. I think it's not a bad thing. But Gwyneth, there's going to be increasing resentment of the fact mm -hmm. that Scottish MPs, sometimes in certain parliaments in a critical uh, deciding position, are voting on English issues purely English issues, which are totally devolved to the Unlike Scottish Parliament. Unlike many hundreds of years to, when the English to, MPs have been voting on the Scottish issues. But, but, I mean, that, one was reason that, but that was a unified Parliament at uh, that But one reason why we finished up so with think, all the row about the poll tax was because actually, of that. This is exactly what's going to happen. We're going to see a move towards keeping the Scottish MPs and the Welsh MPs, well, uh, to a lesser extent, as, as out as of uh, votes on English, English mean, issues. This has been an issue which has made the Conservative, feel, Conservative Party feel quite comfortable with itself over the last I, year. I actually, I'm the, the, well, let me, let, let's just move on for a second, because as I was saying, it's made you, it's made you feel quite comfortable with yourselves. Something that's been very difficult for you has been the European issue, which but I want to talk about now. Just finishing on that, I'm a Scot, and I've always worried about this angle of the, the, what's known as the West Lothian question, very, very strongly on behalf of my English constituents. Well, I'll have to allow you to worry about the <laughs> West Lothian question on the your own. The only thing we need to worry about is whether they tell all the Scots and Wales to go home, and then you and I will be in a certain amount of difficulty. No, I wouldn't. I'd say no. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about Europe. Okay. Um, we've seen uh, the Conservative Party perceived as moving quite radically to the right over the European issue. Um, is that helping you? Um, I, I'm not sure how big an issue Europe is going to be when we come to the next election. I think the economy and domestic issues will still be the main one. Uh, but there's no doubt that the, the Tory unity, and I'm a very pro-European person myself, Tory unity on the need for more subsidiarity, more decisions taken in national governments and at local level rather than always in Brussels. Mm. Uh, m a agreement about flexibility. I think as we move to enlargement, it's going to be very difficult to say that given the huge differences in economic, social and political conditions, say in some of the new Eastern European states uh, coming into the Union, uh, that they are very different conditions from those in the more mature domestic mm. economies of France, Germany and ourselves. Mm. And I think that um, it is going to be necessary to have flexibility and on that I think we are pointing the way. Ben Campbell. Well I'm against a pick and mix Europe. Uh, I'm with John McGregor when he argues for subsidiarity, that's to say nothing should be done in Brussels which can more effectively be done in London or indeed in Edinburgh. We've got subsidiarity within the United Kingdom with uh, uh, Cardiff and Edinburgh being centres of power, then we should certainly apply that principle as ruthlessly as we possibly can in the European Union itself. But, but I think your, your party is seen as great supporters Indeed of the are. European Union. And, we always have and the way the single currency has been going recently, we now have parity with the dollar ah, as far as the EMU is concerned. But that might, must make your position quite difficult, no, doesn't it? No, I mean, there's a, no, no, I can see where the agreement is no, on no, subsidiarity. No, no, I mean, there's not an economist worth, uh, worth his, his or her salt, and I include John McGregor in this uh, category, who doesn't recognise that the euro is bound to float against other currencies. But it hasn't the floated anywhere other than down, Well, has the it? reason is because the United States dollar has been extraordinarily strong against all predictions and a point will come at which inflation begins to be a real threat in the United States uh, and there will be changes in the relative positions of both the euro uh, and the United States dollar. But what is actually happening is with a weaker euro uh, then both uh, France and Germany have taken the opportunity to achieve quite substantial economic growth with a weaker euro they're able to export much more easily than they would if the euro was stronger actually the weakness of the euro has very little to do with the importance of the completion of the single market by having a single currency okay we'll separate these two those two issues now what's the gossip in your party Gwyneth Dunwoody um, as far as the euro is concerned I think there will always be a very uh, serious debate. I want someone to move on to telling the British people the, the uh, cons as well as the pros and explaining to them that if you have a unified taxation system but you don't have control over the people that are taking those decisions, you may finish up 
with a number of answers that you're not particularly comfortable with because if you think about it, one reason that you have uh, Westminster having so much control is they take the money in and they decide the way it goes out. And if you don't like them, you get rid of them. So when we talk about Europe, we have to think that it uh, resembles more and more of the Habsburg dynasty just before the collapse of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And we ought seriously to talk to people about whether you maintain structures with the agreement of people on a solid basis or whether you just keep imposing them from above and you're astonished when it all gets very ramshackle. Are Brown and Blair worried that the Tories might have uh, the ace card at the next election as far as the euro is concerned? They strike me, neither of them as being worried about this at all. They are very determined, I think, that there will be a real input from the public. And that's in the final analysis what must be important. You, you can call things whatever you like. You can announce we are now a union but if in fact the people of that organization whatever their nationality do not agree then you get the situation which we have found frequently within the United Kingdom. I think we're going to find them very cautious about the euro, the euro and the single currency when we come to the next election right and I think the real test is going to be how it looks after that uh, now some of the issues are it's not just the the position of the euro at the moment because I agree with Ming it can move up and down and this is very temporary I suspect but the real issues are when we move into a more difficult recessionary period or whether for example big issues of public expenditure come up as the as enlargement comes through very big issues yeah, in relation to pensions a position you pensions can't and things of that sort and now that is that is the when the real issue I think will start yeah. to, to I be this is a, the, 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 I, I think say, this is a review of the year not a discussion yeah. about whether or not yeah. the euro is going to work so but, but can I just make Gwyneth makes a very good point about the dislocation of the electorate with the European Union. And that's why I think it was of some importance that Paddy Ashton was the first leader of political party in this country to say you can't join the single currency, uh, which is not just economic but political uh, and perhaps constitutional, without having a referendum of the people of the United Kingdom. Uh, and I think all parties now accept that. I also think there's a very substantial body of argument which now takes the view that what you need for Europe is a constitution so that you can properly oh, no. delineate yes. so you can probably delineate mm. the responsibilities uh, of the states as compared to Brussels mm. and also establish the rights of the individual citizens. All right, no, let's, that's Gwyneth, before you, I'm going to ask you a question now, Gwyneth, about transport before you get too embroiled in the <laughs> European argument. It's been quite a hot potato this year and it looks as if it's going to be a hot potato next year too. What's the government achieved in the last year as far as this very difficult election? Well, apart from anything else, you've now got the first attempt to pull together the railway system, create a strategic rail authority, get people working together. You've got money going into rural buses. You've got a number of uh, regional transport plans, which are very important. A lot of the groundwork has been done. The difference was that because of all this constitutional change we've been debating, uh, where there would have been a transport bill in every one of the three years, we've only mm. had a major transport bill this year. So there's been a lot of time to do a lot of homework, and I think some of the answers are going to be very good. I noticed that you didn't mention um, the privatising of uh, privatising of air traffic control, and you didn't mention privatising the tube. John McGregor, you were transport yes. uh, secretary of state for transport once. I bet you would have loved to have privatised the tube, well, wouldn't you, and um, privatised air traffic control? I, I, I would certainly have done that, but not in the form the government's proposing to do it, which I don't think will work. Uh, I would certainly I, I privatised the railways, and what a success that's been. We've Ooh, seen a huge John. increase. Gwyneth, the, the real Lord test, the real, hang on, the real test is whether the public responds, whether you get, and I always said this was going to be the real test, whether you get a lot more people going back onto the rail, both as passengers and but for freight. But you think freight. that is because of the high been, quality of privatisation? Of course it's happened that way and everyone agrees that in freight, it's been the opening up of the freight that has actually got more freight for the first time back on the road. So that's been between a, the companies. No, it's quite clear that, that it's been a success because the traffic is much greater and that's exactly what I wanted to achieve. But coming back to the question you asked. I think actually the transport policy has been an unmitigated disaster. John Prescott's had four transport ministers in two years. The privatisation uh, he hasn't was actually, great, he hasn't the rest actually of it's done a disaster. anything. <laughs> Gwyneth's point is an, about other measures is an excuse. Let me just, he just hasn't done anything. Let me just That's the real truth of the matter. Yeah. Too, too, too many, got, there have been got, far too many predictions of things criticism. that were going to be brought about second, which haven't been able to be achieved. There's been criticism about John Prescott, a lot of criticism about John Prescott, how he's been managing this department. You've got two Jags as well, haven't you? One. No. You only got one. I got one. I sold, you sold one. Poverty overtook me, and I had to sell one. <laughs> I, have, I have an eight-year-old Jaguar. <laughs> Nothing very great. But I think on the on the air traffic control, this really is a considerable problem for the government. I mean, after all, the opposition to it is being led by Gavin Strang, one of these four transport ministers to whom John McGregor has just referred. I think the government might well find it difficult to get that bill through the House of Commons, and rightly so. No other country 
in the world, so far as I'm aware, has ever privatized its air traffic control. Why? Because yeah, there are important public interest issues in retaining it in the public sector. The Sadly, I'm going to have to stop you all there. I'm about to, we've run out of time. It just arranged time for me to thank my guests, Ming Campbell, Gwyneth Dunwoody and John McGregor. In our next programme, Kosovo, from the announcement that NATO airstrikes were underway to the late night statement that the fighting was all over. Arguments over the police handling of anti-China demonstrations during the visit of President Jiang Zemin. And Lady Thatcher breaks a three-year silence in the Lords to speak up in defence of the former Chilean dictator, General Augusto Pinochet. But from Westminster, for now, goodbye.